Ed Shields is a throwback to the age of working sail. During the pre-war era, his family operated cod schooners in Alaska. After the war, they were among the pioneers who trawled for king crab in the Bering Sea. He remembers the Japanese crab vessels that crowded around the cod boats, where king crab devoured the fish wastes. Like the other American pioneers, the Shields family resented the intrusion. I was aboard the Charles Wilson, a three-mast schooner, and my father was on the Sophie Christensen. The Japanese were uh, encroaching on the Bristol Bay salmon fishing area, so he sent a telegram to Seattle ordering a dozen high-powered rifles for each vessel and a case of ammunition each. The Coast Guard didn't care for this at all. The State Department didn't care for it, but the news media did. It made good news. There was no television at that time, but they did get um, in the national magazines like Time and Life, and the adverse publicity to Japanese manufactured goods was so severe at that time from this campaign. The Japanese decided to pull out of Bristol Bay area, and he sent a telegram down saying, Bristol Bay is all clear now, Japanese gone home. Lowell Wakefield was the marketing genius who led the American entry into King Crab. Lowell Wakefield was a real visionary. He, he was a man that had, had a vision that sometimes was difficult for the rest of us to see, but he believed that King Crab could be the gourmet food of, of the 20th century. I guess if it was the true grandfather of the present industry, it was Lowell Wakefield. Well, basically, the, the problem was that the resource was so healthy that we were catching more crab than we could actually process. And so we had to figure out methods to process crab faster and put it into a form that could be sold domestically. Uh, Lowell Wakefield, the Wakefield Fisheries, did a tremendous job in, in innovating uh, crab in the shell. Well, the Japanese dominated the market with the canned product, and the Geisha brand was world world known and and probably the market leader by a significant degree. And we'll always believe that you cannot compete with with the canned product. And the story is that he learned that crab froze extremely well because he had started off his career in canning and one night they didn't have time to can all the products so he thought he was putting it in a cooler and it ended up being in the freezer and it, the product froze and when they thought it out they realized that it was probably a superior way to preserve the product in canning. By the way, uh, Lowell, what does the future hold for this industry? Lowell, this, I'm sure, is one of the bright spots of our great state of Alaska. I think that the king crab industry has a terrific future and a lot of special meaning because most of our traditional fisheries the big ones for salmon and for halibut, are summertime fisheries. This one is a wintertime fishery, bringing in dollars to Alaska fishermen, processing workers, and business people at the time of year when we need it the most. While Wakefield was first, the Shields family wasn't far behind. First uh, inkling I had of a king crab in Bering Sea was in 1947 when I was uh, one of the crew members aboard the uh, C.A. Thayer. The deep sea was up there that year. This was Wakefield's boat. It was a brand new uh, East Coast style side rig dragger, about 135 feet long, very modern, a very, very good, capable boat. Uh, my father could hear this on the radio every day as to how many crab they were bringing in, and that sounded very good. The family bought a 148-foot surplus wooden army freighter, rigged it as a side trawler, and christened it the Nordic Maid. We were fishing with trawl nets. Everything came aboard in one big bag and was dumped on deck. If there were a lot of uh, good fishing, we'll say, uh, we might have five or six or 800 crabs, king male crabs, in that net, and maybe 500 females. Uh, they're a a strong-bodied animal, so we could stand on top of the pile of king crab without materially hurting them. We would pick the male crabs out and throw them across the deck to the other side where they were going to be butchered, and we had an open port 
in the side of the rail and the uh, females were scooted out through that port. Even as the American presence grew on the crab grounds, the Japanese remained on the scene, fishing with tangle nets from their Kawasaki boats. I remember one time when the uh, Charles Wilson in 47, um, we were just laying an anchor on a day that was too rough for us to fish. The Japanese boat came alongside of us and they were begging for food. They wanted something more to eat. Uh, they had been in their boat uh, probably 10 hours, maybe more that day. Uh, all that they had to eat while they were aboard was what small crab that they could take out of the net and they had a charcoal brazier on the back of the boat and they put the uh, crabs on that and cooked them and picked the meat out uh, to eat during the day. But otherwise, they had nothing else to eat all day.